We're so glad that you found this Peak City message today. Our prayer is that during our time together, you're able to discover Jesus and are encouraged to follow him fearlessly. Yeah, let's celebrate what's happening there. Isn't that incredible? It's beautiful. Um, the work that we're doing with the Exodus Road, which by the way, uh, Laura Parker, who's on the video, she's going to be here on December 18th to share more. You don't want to miss that Sunday. It's going to be special. Um, but the work we're doing with the Exodus Road, uh, it is so important. And uh, I get the, the privilege of sharing with you today that uh, the, the specific initiative that we're going to be giving to this year, this December, this is our, our Build the Future offering is in effect. Anything given in the month of December that's above our normal monthly operating expenses as a church is set aside for these special initiatives that we're doing to build the future for people here in, Peak, here, here in Colorado Springs, here at Peak City, and people all across the world. Um, but the, the thing we get to do with the Exodus Road is we actually get to come together and help build in the Freedom House their new education room. And so their new education room is actually going to help them with uh, computers, with curriculum, with job training skills. So that these women who have been rescued from sex trafficking can learn a new way to provide for themselves and to provide for their kids. Isn't that beautiful? That's freedom, man. That's tangible, real freedom. It's amazing. And so um, I want you to pray about giving big uh, this this uh, December, we give online at peakcityco.com. You can give through our wall boxes in the back of the room. Um, but we ask everyone, if you call this place home, pray about giving. If you're not currently giving, this is a great time to start. And, it, and if you are already giving, we're praying that you would um, consider giving above and beyond so that we can do some really, really special work uh, across the world. So let's give big. Build the Future offering is here. And I'm so, so, so pumped to see what God does with it, all right? Um, I cannot believe that it is December. That is crazy. I feel like this year is just flying by so rapidly. And, you know, for those of you that have kids, you know this time of year is like when, like, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. Your kids are crazy right now. They're psychopaths. You gave them Thanksgiving break and, like, you gave them an inch and now they're taking miles from you. It's, it's psycho. And so, like, our kids right now, I love them to death. They're amazing. Um, but, like, this is a big deal for our family. This has been the first semester. and so It's been a whole new reality for Brittany and I to adjust to. It's, it's the new reality of, like, we have all of our kids in school. Like, there's not one kid clawing on Brittany's leg all day long. It's like the first time in 11 years that that's happened. And so uh, our, our youngest daughter, Tatum, it's so funny, she just started kindergarten all day, all week long. And uh, the jury is out in her mind on school. Very uncertain. Okay? Uh, she came home the first week. She, she, she loves math. So she was so excited to go to school and learn math. She was, you know, big math, big numbers girl. So she was really excited. First week she comes home, comes home from school, she says, Dad, these days are a lot longer than I expected. I said, yeah, they are, girl. She comes home week two and she says, Dad, this is not nearly as fun as I thought it would be. I said, yeah, <laughs> buckle up for 12, 16 more years of this, girl. This is, this is life, you know. It was so funny because her, her, her teacher, sweet kindergarten teacher, she attends here at Peak City. Her name's Miss Council. And uh, Miss Council told us this story about Tatum recently where uh, all, all the kids in class were complaining about school, all these kindergartners complaining about what they have to do in school. And Tatum's like, oh, I really don't like school. Wish you could go home. And, and so Miss Council, Jody, was like, uh, Tatum, like, we're friends, though. Like, we go to the same church. Come on, like, this is great. We get to be in class all day together. And she looks at her with this sass, looks at her and goes, Miss Council, I'm just here for the math. I was like, girl, girl, you got, you got to calm that sass down. Like, chill, chill, my girl. Oh, man, but um, math, you know, I, the, the, more I've been, the more I've been digging into this passage, the more God's been teaching me that in my own heart and my own soul and in your heart and your soul, the more I get to know you, the more I'm seeing that we do a lot of math inside our hearts and inside our souls, that as we process through pain in life, as we process through uh, difficulty and hardship and problems, there's a lot of math that goes on behind the scenes. And what I'm learning more and more is that the math that I do in my heart and the math that you do in your heart is oftentimes um, amplifying your anxiety. The math and the, the things you're thinking through are actually making life harder and more painful for you than, than God intended it to be. And so what I think God wants to show you today, what he's been showing me, is that if we can change the math we do inside of us, if, 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 if we can change what we multiply, right? Because what you multiply matters. And, 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 and if you can change what you multiply, that, that, that this is actually the path to God giving you peace. And I know that's what so many of us are after today. I know that, especially in the holiday season, it's the one thing very few of us have. It's so funny. We sing about peace more in the month of December through Christmas carols than any other month. It's also the least peaceful month for any of us. 
It's like the one thing we want, I'm telling you, the path to peace, it's, it's all about what you multiply. What you multiply really, really matters. And so I'm praying that God would set some of you free today with this, and I'm, and I'm praying that maybe God might use this message uh, to help some of you make a decision to start following Jesus for the very first time today. And so with that big anticipation I got for this one, let's jump in. Y'all ready? John 6, verse 1. I'm telling you, man, if you're, not in, if you're not a church person, if you're not used to being in church, if you've never read the Bible on your own, you are in good company. This is a, this is a, gr- a great place for you to be. We're not going to say anything or do anything that you will not understand, all right? It don't matter if you've been in church all your life or this is your first time, we're all in this together. All right, John chapter 6, verse 1. Let's let God change us today. It says this. <clears throat> Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. That is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs that he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and he sat down with his disciples because the Jewish Passover festival was near. And when Jesus looked up and he saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? But he asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Now pause for a second. Jesus is amassing a crowd now. This is actually a moment of big, 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 big opportunity for Jesus and for his disciples. His, his teachings and his miracles were drawing people in by the thousands. I mean, right now we've got 5,000 men. You add the women and children. We're over 10,000 people that have gathered. This is a big opportunity. And, and, and not only is the, the ministry of Jesus drawing people in, but also the Jewish Passover festival was near. So we have even more people coming into the fold. We have even more people who are interested in spiritual things and are giving Jesus a chance. I mean, this is a big, big opportunity. Jesus, in this moment, can spread the message of the unconditional love of God to a massive, massive audience. But with big problems, or with with, with big opportunities like that, always come big problems, right? Jesus sees this massive crowd of people, opportunity, and then all of a sudden the problems start popping up. He looks out and he says, oh no, oh no. A lot of people, but they're all hungry. And, and you don't know this, but there's a reason that most churches don't have a service at noon. Because <laughs> when y'all hungry, you get hangry. And when you get hangry, it don't matter how good the sermon is or how much the worship hits, all you're thinking about is raising canes and the superior chicken that it is. Don't come at me, Chick-fil-A people. I will preach the Raising Cane's gospel for a long time. Also, they're open on Sundays, which is when we all crave chicken. That was not in my last sermon. I don't know why I went on chicken tirade just now, but I did. But this is what happens, right? Jesus sees this problem, but it's, 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 it's accompanied by this great opportunity. And this is always what happens in your life. This is how life works. When you get an opportunity, it looks awesome, but it always brings more problems. Right? When you have no opportunity, you actually have no problems and life is pretty easy. Like for me, the, the most peaceful, stress, least stressful time in, in my life was when I was a freshman in college. All right? I had I'd made it through high school. I was no longer living with my parents. I've got this freedom and also no one wants to employ me. I have no opportunity. So what do we do? We sat around like dumb freshmen in college and we made problems. I, I remember we were so stupid as freshmen in college. Um, I, I, we had four guys that were living in two apartments right next door to each other. And, and none of us had any opportunity. We had no promise, no potential in life. And so we have these two apartments. There, there, there's one wall that connects, that, 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 that separates the, the two apartments. So what did we do? We punched a hole through both walls so we could just speak to each other through it. It's like, what are we doing? We're creating problems because <laughs> we have no opportunity. Right? Life is so much easier before you get a promotion. Life is so much easier before you start making more money. It, it, it looks awesome, the opportunity is great, but the problems that follow start to add up. When you have kids, it's an amazing opportunity. And also, how are you going to afford kids and diapers? Do you know how expensive it is to catch poop? You didn't budget for that. I'm telling you, it's more than you think. When you, when you, you know, step into some new season of your career, it's awesome, but how are you going to level up your skills? How are you going to handle the new stress? All these opportunities always come with problems. And here's the, here's the I know it's not going to be comforting to you. It's not going to be 
This is not what you came to church to hear, but it's true. In this instance, Jesus sees a great opportunity, and he identifies a great problem. They're all hungry, and we have nothing to feed them with. And I want you to see what he does. He, he does not solve the problem immediately. Actually, what he does is he invites his disciples into the problem. See, I know it doesn't sound great, and I know it's not going to be an Instagrammable clip, and I know it's not going to make more people want to come to our church, but I need to tell you this. God will absolutely not solve your problems. <laughs> Welcome to church. <laughs> it's a place of hope, and grace, and also he will not solve any of your problems. He won't. He'll let you sit in them. He'll let you sit in the tension of a problem for weeks and months, sometimes even years. Some of y'all have been sitting in problems for years. And it's not that God caused it, but he does allow it. It's an uncomfortable truth that most, most churches don't like to talk about. God will absolutely allow you to sit in the tension of a problem because he knows what that problem will do for you. He knows what it's going to develop in you. God will not solve your problems. No, 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 no. He, 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 will, he will let you sit there. He'll let you feel the pain, right? Because God is trying to play the long game. My, 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 uh, my 11-year-old son, my, my oldest son, um, we're trying to teach him, right? And so he, he's a little bit mad at, at Brittany and I right now because we got him doing a lot of chores. I'm talking like a lot of chores. Like we got him like loading the dishwasher, unloading the dishwasher, wiping the counters, sweeping the floor, all this. And he's mad. He's like, Dad, why do I have to do this? And I'm like, son, this is why I had you. <laughs> you do understand that when I signed up for this, I signed up for a season of free labor. <laughs> okay. But no, like we're trying to play the long game with him, right? Like we, we have to put him through this, this pain and this tension and this frustration so that when he is older and he gets to be in his 20s and he's, he's got those kinder good looks that he's been blessed with and that real short stature that he's been blessed with and all that, we need him to be able to bring home a girl to his apartment and her walk in and go, whoa, this place is not a dump. I'm trying to improve his, his marriage prospects, right? We're trying, to, we're trying to play the long game. God is trying to play the long game with you. Uh, Paul, Paul would write it like this in, in the New Testament, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. But let me tell you, the way he will complete it is not by solving your problems. He loves you too much to solve all your problems. You need him. You need to sit on him for a little bit. And so he lets the disciples sit on him. But here's the deal. When the problems come up, when the problems start rearing their ugly heads, and God allows it to happen, and it's frustrating, and you don't know what's, what's when, when the problems rear their heads, that's when the math begins in your soul. That's when the math starts going on in your heart and in your head. And look, look at how Philip reacts to it. Philip, the, the disciple that Jesus invited into this tension Look at the math that goes on for Philip in verse 7. It says, Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. How many of y'all in here by show of hands are in your family, you're the money person, the budget conscious, how, how much does something cost, you're analyzing the spending, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can raise your hand and, and be proud about that. You're the adult, you're responsible. <laughs> my wife said, hey, my wife said, hey, because I have very few things in this life, in this marriage that I can like hold my, hold my head up high on. I'm the money guy. Okay. I'm the one that's like, hey, we shouldn't do that because of X, Y, Z. And she's the dreamer, right? She's like, hey, we should do this because it'd be great for our kids and make great memories and, and it'll be awesome. And she makes our life so much more fun. And also I've been footing that bill now for 20 years. All right. <laughs> Philip's the money guy. He's like, how are you going to feed these people? Well, first off, it'd take more than half a year's wages. And here's the deal. Money people in the room, you know this. He ain't wrong. <laughs> Don't money people always make sense? It's always logical. So this is like more than half a year's wages, and he's not wrong. He's right. But I want you to notice the math that he did in his soul. At first, the problem was we don't have enough food. We were going to get food. Notice, notice what he multiplied. One problem, we don't have enough food, became two problems. Not only do we not have enough food, we're broke. He multiplied the problem. He took one problem, we don't have enough food, and he said, yeah, 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 we don't have money either. Ooh, how quick it happened. 
See, this is what happens. When the devil himself, who's the ultimate pessimist in your life, he, he's the one who is out to steal, kill, and destroy the very life that God wants for you. The devil combined with your weak, sinful nature that every single one of us have, there's not a person on this earth that doesn't have a very, very dark and weak, sinful nature. Those two things combined, every problem you face, the voice of the devil and the voice of your sinful nature will be whispering for you to multiply the problems. You got marriage issues? You sitting next to someone that you're at odds with right now? You not sitting next to someone because you're at odds with them? And, and, and let's say it's like a communication issue, right? Like you're just not, you just don't understand each other. You, you, you're, there, there's, a, there's a gap in your communication. There's something off. You're just not getting each other. You're not clicking, right? Well, if you're not careful, you will multiply that problem. And one problem will then become, well, it's also kind of a, an intimacy problem. I don't know if she's been pursuing me or if he's been pursuing me. I don't know. Or, and th then it can become a, an issue with the in-laws. I mean, my, the, the in-laws and the the distance there, the lack of understanding. Then it can become a boundaries issue. It's like, man, the then it's like, man, you start pulling out the record of wrongs, everything that they've done to you in the past that has not been, you start pulling all that out. Then all of a sudden you go, man, they're not even the same person that I married. They've changed. Whew, that's not even the same person that I was at the altar with. See what happened? One problem was multiplied into about eight problems. And before you know it, you feel overwhelmed. You feel like you, don't, you can't solve one problem. You struggle to solve one. You sure as heck can't solve eight. Um, if you are in financial hardship, I know a lot of people in our church have experienced uh, financial transition in life. Right, like you had a job pre-COVID, COVID happened, careers changed, the great resignation happened and everyone was changing jobs and everyone's rethinking life. But all of a sudden the job you're in now uh, doesn't pay what the old job used to. But your standard of living is the exact same. And you're trying to figure this out. <clears throat> That's a hard issue. I, I believe there is no more difficult issue. And it's going to sound very spoiled in first world because it is spoiled in first world. There is no more difficult issue, I believe, for the 21st century Western American to deal with than decreasing standard of living. It's the number one thing that Americans don't know how to do. It's, it's hard. But if you're not careful, hold up. One problem if the devil's whispered in your ear and the sinful nature's whispered in the other, can be multiplied into a whole host of problems. All of a sudden, it's, it's not just that you have a financial hardship and a standard of living issue. It's that your boss never sees you. Your boss doesn't notice you. And how dare they pass you over for that promotion when they should have given it to you. And, and then it becomes a problem with your family. Like, man, they, they helped out my sibling. They didn't help out me the same way. I've always been the one who isn't favored. And th then all of a sudden, it becomes... I'm in the wrong occupation. And I'm not even using my gifts anymore. I'm not even fulfilled by this anymore. What am I doing with my life? You see what I'm saying? One problem you, 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 becomes quickly four, five, six because you allow that voice in your head to multiply your problems. It's the math in your soul. If you're lonely right now, we're entering the season where people are struggling with loneliness more than ever. More suicides happen in the month of December and January than any other months combined because people deal with loneliness. If you're lonely... And let's say the issue is your friends aren't reaching out to you or you're not reaching out to them or schedules aren't syncing because it's the holidays. If you're not careful, one problem will become a bunch. If you're not careful, all of a sudden it'll be, I mean, maybe, I, maybe I'm just not good enough. And you'll wallow in self-hatred. All of a sudden you're not intelligent enough or witty enough or funny enough or successful enough. You know, and then, then it can become, well, maybe I've got the wrong friends. How dare they not think about me? You start villainizing them. Then, then, then all of a sudden you go, it's, it's regret. Why did I move here? Ever since I moved here, I made that job move. I've not had the community I used to have. See what I'm saying? The devil wants nothing more than for you in your head when you face a problem, for you to multiply the problem because he knows. He knows if he can get you to multiply the problem, he knows that he will get you overwhelmed. And when you're overwhelmed, you become hopeless. When you are overwhelmed and you can't fix one problem, much less 20, and, you, and you're hopeless, when you're hopeless, that's when you make the dumbest decisions of your life. That's when you do the things that wreck your marriage. That's when you do the things that destroy your career. That's when you do the things that set you back decades. That's the, that's the time when you develop addictions that take you years to overcome. It's when you're hopeless. It, when you're hopeless, that's when the devil steals, kills, and destroys your life. 
And I believe right now, I've been praying it all week, that God would bring someone here to this room or he'd bring someone that's watching online right now that is feeling hopeless. I know for a fact that in this room, watching with us online, there is someone right now who is on the brink of suicide. I know there's someone who's on the brink of divorce. I know there's someone who, who's on the brink of an affair. I know someone, there's someone in this room, there's someone watching right now who's on the brink of going back into an addiction that you've kicked for years and you're about to go back to it. You're hopeless. And I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this from the voice of God through a flawed man. I believe that God has you here and has you watching this as an act of his grace towards you. I believe God has you here because he wants to rescue you from doing something that is so stupid and so self-destructive and is going to ruin your life. He wants to rescue you. God has you here because he wants to show you that there is another way. There's another, there's another form of math. You, you can multiply something different. And what you multiply matters. It matters. See, you can multiply your problems or there's another way, there's another way. And it comes in the next verse from Andrew. Verse 8. Oh, man. God, use this. God, use this. Free somebody right now, God. Free somebody. Verse 8 says, another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, he spoke up. He didn't multiply the problems. Check this. He says, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far... Will they go among so many? I just believe he said it with a smile on his face because I think he knew. I think he knew what was about to happen. I think he knew because he'd been following Jesus. He'd seen the power of Jesus. He knew what was about to happen. He says, big opportunity, big problem. Whew. Jesus, I don't have much, but here is a boy, and he's got five small loaves of bread and two small fish, here is a boy, and he's, but this is all we've got. And I know it's not much, but Jesus, would you multiply our capacity? Would you not multiply your problems? Would you take what I have, Jesus, and would you multiply my capacity? Friends, when, when you are faced with a problem, God will let you face it. He will let you sit in it. He will let you live in the tension of it. And it is up to you what you multiply. And what you multiply matters. And you can choose to either let the devil and your sinful nature multiply the problem, or you can make the choice to turn to God and say, God, will you multiply my capacity? Will you, will you take what I've got, even if it's not much? You know, that's the, that's the most beautiful part of this passage. What Andrew just offered Jesus in comparison to this problem is nothing. We got 10,000 people. And he says, hey, here's a few pieces of bread and a fish. What you got it's nothing. It's, it's insignificant. I'm telling you, Jesus is trying to get a hold of somebody. I know there's a tired parent in this room right now. You're either parenting young kids and you're exhausted, or you're parenting teenage kids who are also, FYI, young adults who are making their own decisions because they're adults now, albeit young, and you are emotionally fried and emotionally exhausted and you have nothing left and you feel like you have nothing. I'm telling you, God just wants you to hear this right now. All you have left is all he needs. All you have left, I'm telling you, God can do so much more than it's all he needs. Tired mom, tired dad in the room, you come before God and say, God, here's the last bit of patience I have. Here's the last bit of compassion I have. Here's the last bit of wisdom I have to navigate this situation. Jesus, will you multiply my capacity? Will you take it and will you do more with it than I could ever do on my own. I'm telling you, if you'll pray that prayer right now, God will meet you and he will begin to multiply your capacity and all you have will be all he needs. Some of you right now are dealing with a mental health issue. You're swirling into depression or, or, or maybe it's, a, it's, a, it's an addiction you're stepping back into. And what's funny is, and I know this speaking as, as, a, as a former addict, as, as, a, as a former fellow struggler with you, that oftentimes when you're in those pits of despair, um, you think you've got to go from point A all the way to point Z in one big move. If I'm going to overcome the pit of addiction, if I'm going to overcome my depression, if I'm going to overcome this despair, I've got to change it all. And you don't have that in you. Let me tell you, you don't have to have all that in you. 
all you have right now is all he needs. You might only have one phone call you can make to a friend to say, hey, will you hold me accountable? You might only have one little thing you can do. You, You might have the energy to get up and go to the gym and start some little good discipline in your life. Let me tell you, that is all he needs. If you came before him and said, I can't beat it on my own. Here's all I've got. Jesus, it ain't much. It's a couple pieces of bread and a couple fish. I know you got 10,000 people you got to feed. I'm telling you, Jesus could use what little you have and he could multiply it. He could use it to do more than you could ever imagine. There's a student in this room right now. I know it. There's a high school student in this room right now that has big dreams. You got big dreams, but you ain't got a path to get there. You don't know, you got kids around you at school that seem to be getting better grades and you got people who seem to be already ahead of you in their career moves and, but you, you got big dreams to make a difference and you just have no idea how you're gonna get there. Let me tell you, as a satisfied customer, as someone who can report this to you as a testimony, if you would just come before God and say, God, I don't have much, but all that I have, I give to you. I'll give you the last little bit of work ethic I have. I'll give you a little bit of my devotion, what little I have left. I'll, I'll, I'll be willing to look like the, the Christian weirdo at school. And God, what I have, would you take it and would you multiply it? I'm telling you, I can tell you from experience, he will not waste it. He will multiply it. When people in my hometown, I know some of them are watching online right now. When people in my hometown hear that Petey became a pastor and he's preaching the gospel of Jesus, to a church of over a 1,000 people. I know what they're saying. They're going, Petey? The kid that sold me weed back in the hallway? <laughs> what? <laughs> and they're not wrong. When I started following Jesus, I was, the, I was the kid in youth group who didn't know anything. I didn't grow up going to church. I didn't grow up with ambitions to be a pastor. I was horrible at public speaking. Every time I got up in high school to speak in front of the class, my pits would sweat and my stutter would come out. It would all be awful. But all I did, I'm telling you, I've done a lot of things wrong in my, in my years. One thing I have done that I can hold my head up high on is I've constantly come before God and say, God, whew, here's all I've got. Would you multiply it? Would you use me for more than I could ever dream of or even capable of doing myself. God, I don't even know the Bible, and I'm going to Bible college? What? I never read the book of Acts before, and Acts was the first class we ever had in in Bible college. I showed up, I'm like, Acts, I thought it was A-X-E. I thought we were talking about an axe that you chop wood with. I found it was the Acts of the Apostles. Like, okay, learning. Learning. We're getting somewhere. All I have was all he needed. And I've experienced more in 20 years of following him than I ever dreamed I would. Because all I had was all he needed, and he could multiply my capacity. I'm telling you, someone out there right now needs to hear this, whether you're a business leader, whether it's in your marriage, and you don't know how you're going to find love to love your spouse with. Like, someone out there needs to hear this. If you would stop worrying about all the problems and multiplying all the problems, if you would instead turn to God and say, God, here I am. What little bit I got, would you multiply it? And if you would, you'll experience what they experienced in verse 10. Jesus hears this response. He says, oh, you're going to multiply? You're going to ask me to multiply your capacity? I love his next verse. Jesus said, have the people sit down. They ain't ready for this. <laughs> have them sit down. Let me tell you, you ain't ready for what God can do in your life if you would actually surrender to him. He's going to say, hey, you're going to need to sit down. Because <laughs> what I'm about to do is going to blow your mind. He says, there's plenty of grass in that place. And, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. And so, so Jesus then took the loaves and he gave thanks. And he distributed it to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. And when they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. And so they gathered them and they filled their 12 baskets with the pieces of the five loaves left over by those who had eaten. See, not only is all you have all he needs, all you have in the hands of God is actually more than enough. It's enough to create leftovers in your life. I'm telling you, you're going to have so much fruit and so much blessing and so much, so much favor in your life if you would just surrender what you have to God. It'd be like mama sent you home with a Tupperware full of food at Thanksgiving that you're never going to eat. It's leftovers. It's more than enough. It's more than enough. <clears throat> but I know what you're thinking. If you're skeptical of faith and church, if you're watching online and you are just trying to give this a chance, I know what you're thinking. Because 
I often think the same things. <clears throat> it's one of the advantages I have. I didn't grow up in church. I didn't grow up with plans to be a pastor, nothing like that. I didn't read the Bible much. I was new. I didn't have a lot of advantages over my fellow peer pastors. One thing I did have, though, is that because I didn't grow up going to church, I had a very unhealthy at the time but now healthy dose of skepticism. And I know when I preach a passage like this and I preach it like that, I know what you're thinking. I know you're thinking, Petey, really? Really? So I'm just supposed to, like, ask God to multiply my capacity. I'm just supposed to say, God, here's what I've got. And all of a sudden, me talking to God about it, me inviting God, giving God access to my life, all of a sudden, that's going to change the way I love my spouse. That's going to, you know, increase my joy at work. It's going to change my perspective. Like, all I got to do is just talk to God and, okay, but, like, really, how does this work? What are the steps I really need to take? Yeah, 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 yeah. Pray about it. Sure. But what do I really need to do? See, we live in such a culture of self-help, which is beautiful. We're all trying to better ourselves. We want to know how it actually works. And this is not, again, not an Instagrammable clip, not something that you're like, ooh, that's going to speak to thousands. It's just real. I can tell you right now that I don't know how it works. I ain't got a clear answer for you. I don't know how it works. I don't know how when you, in, when you open yourself up to God and you actually speak to God and you say, God, here's my problem that I'm facing and here's what I got. Will you, will you do something with this? Will you multiply my capacity? Will you, will you somehow make this enough? I don't know how it works. I just know that when Jesus shows up, when Jesus is given access to your life, when the person of Jesus is present, I'm just telling you, things begin to multiply. Things begin to grow. Things begin to change. I don't, I don't know how. Like, I don't even know how. I've, did you notice when we read this passage? There was no explanation as to how this happened. <laughs> it was like, I'm, I'm sitting there going like, I mean, did fish just start like jumping out of the baskets? Like, what is happening here? Do they have to kill the fish? Are the fish alive? Are the fish dead? Like, how did the bread, like, what is happening? <laughs> it's like, nope, they just had enough. I don't know how. I just know that when Jesus shows up, when you invite the person of Jesus, who he really is, into your life, things begin to change. Things begin to multiply. I was, um, I was meeting with a guy, and I can keep it as, I've met with a lot, of, a lot of people over the past month, so I can keep it very, very general. So if you're out there, hopefully you won't even know I'm talking about you. So it's vague. Confidentiality is a real thing, you know. But I met with a guy, and he was just saying, hey, I'm dealing with some mental health issues like all of us. Um, dealing with some thoughts that couldn't get out of his head, like a, like a lot of us. <clears throat> and he said, Petey, how do, how do I fix it? How do I fix this thing going on inside of me? That's okay. Well, first, like, we just met. So, like, tell me about, tell me about your faith. Like, do you, do you believe in God? He's like, oh, yeah, believe in God, was raised in the church, all good. And so, okay, cool. So, with this issue you're dealing with, what do you feel like God has been saying to you about that? What do you feel like God has said to you? He's like, what do you mean? I was like, well, when you pray to God about this, what do you feel like he's bringing up in your heart? What do you feel like he's bringing up in your mind? What do you sense him saying to you about this? And he said, oh, I've never prayed about this. I said, okay. And I said, do, have you ever prayed? Do you pray? He's like, no. And, and, and I don't say that in any way to bring judgments to this person. I say this because the vast majority of 21st century Christians in America believe in a set of principles and ideas, but not a person. Let me tell you right now, this is not a self-help guide. Jesus, if you follow his teachings, it'll make your life better. It's way bigger than that. It's not a set of ideas or principles. It's a person. And when you pray to him, I, I can't tell you how it works. I don't know. I don't know the mysteries of the supernatural and the spiritual world and how God interacts with the physical world and how he changes inside of us. I don't know, I don't know. I just know that when you actually pray and say, God, I believe you're real. You're not an idea. You're not a set of principles. You're not a set of, of theological doctrines. No, no, no. When I believe that you're a person and I say, Jesus, will you take what I've got and make it enough? When you invite the person of Jesus into your life, things change things begin to multiply. 
Everything changes when you invite the, the person of Jesus. Let me say it like this to you. You will never reach your full capacity as a man or a woman. You will never reach your full capacity apart from Jesus. Ever. I don't care how successful you are, you could be more. I don't care how much peace you think you do or don't have, you could have more. You'll never, whatever, whatever level you feel content with in life right now, you'll never get to all you were created to be apart from Jesus, apart from inviting him in. And when you invite him in, things begin to multiply. I'm telling you, I've seen it in my life. When our marriage was at its worst, when, when I was burned out from ministry, I came to God and I said, God, I don't know what to do, but I'm just gonna keep showing up. And will you just take that? Like, I can't do any more thing than, than, than sing to you for 10 minutes in the car. That's all I got. God, will you make it enough? Like some of you right now, the only thing you've got is waking up 20 minutes early before you go to work and just trying to pray and trying to read. I'm saying, that's enough. Take whatever you got. Bring it to God and ask him to multiply it. I'm telling you, he will do it. You will see him do incredible things in your life. I've seen it in this church. You need to understand, you are sitting in a living, breathing example of this spiritual truth. This church started over 15 years ago with a handful of people with a vision and a dream to start a church that reaches people far from God. And I've done the history on this church. It should have shut its doors multiple times. And the only reason I can tell you that we stand here and look around you is multiplying. The only reason I can tell you that we got baptisms on baptisms on baptisms about to happen here in a few minutes. The only, the only reason I can tell you is this, that's what happens when Jesus shows up. That Jesus, the person of Jesus, has constantly been asked to come and be a part of this place, has constantly been asked to come and, and make what, take what we have and multiply it. And I believe with all of my heart that he's going to keep doing it. I believe that when we think about our Build the Future offering, when we think about 2023, I just don't think Jesus is going to stop because we're never going to stop saying, Jesus, here's all we got. Here's our serving. Here's our time. Here's our resources. Here's our love. Here's our, here's our invites. Here's everything. Jesus, will you multiply it? And I'm telling you, he's going to keep going. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like this. It's like a mustard seed. The tiniest little seed. It's like a mustard seed. And you plant it and you water it and it grows. It becomes the largest of the garden plants. And it becomes a tree that birds make their nests in and people find shade in. That's what the, the kingdom of God, it multiplies. It gets bigger. It, gets, it, it grows. Even, even the sacrificial death of Jesus, you know, it was actually an act of multiplication. It was an act of him showing that his love was meant for more and more. When, when Jesus first came and he, and he stretched his arms out and he died on the cross, the Jews believed it was just for them. The world believed that this was the God who loved Israel, not the rest of the world. And, and it's true. God, the, the Old Testament is the story of God's love for Israel. The New Testament, though, is the story of God's love for the whole world. And in 1 John chapter 2, he says it beautifully. He says this, he, Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not only for ours, uh, 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 it's more, but also for the sins of the whole world. It's bigger. It multiplies. This is what Jesus does. And that's why I am so pumped for baptisms. Because when someone gets baptized and we celebrate that moment, if, if, you're, if this is your first baptism service with us, uh, you're about to see a wild scene of celebration. And the reason we celebrate it is that it's not just the forgiveness of sins, that someone has made that private decision with God and now they're publicly declaring it. It's not just celebrating that they're, they're now eternally changed. That's certainly part of it. But it's also we're celebrating the fact that someone is about to step into their full capacity. Someone's about to step into the life that God created for them. When they get lowered into that water, symbolizing and, and aligning themselves with the death, burial, and then come up out of the water, resurrection of Jesus. They are saying, I'm ready for all that God has for me. Jesus, would you multiply my life? Would you multiply my efforts? We had a guy in first service who was sitting front row. And um, three months ago, he sent me a, a message on social media that said he went, from, it was his first time in church in years. And was, he, he went from some sort, of an, some sort of agnostic to a believer in the midst of our service. And we baptized him two months ago. His name is Jacob. And, and I watched Jacob come up out of the water, hands raised came up out of the water just victorious. And I, and I knew what he was stepping into. 
I knew he was about to reevaluate his entire life. I knew he was about to go on a journey of learning who Jesus is, and I've watched him for two months ask beautiful questions, pursue Jesus, change his life. And then today, first service, he gets in here and baptizes his wife who's pregnant with her first child. I'm like, you tell me the love of God doesn't want more. It's more. And so that's what we're going to celebrate today. I want to give you some time to worship God and to maybe some of you, even though you've been in church all your life, talk to him for the first time. Speak to him because he's a real person who's here in the room. And then for those of you that maybe feel led to make that decision to go public with your faith, you don't have to have your life cleaned up. You don't have to have the Bible memorized. None of that. You just have to be ready to say yes to Jesus. Yes to his love and yes to saying all I have is all you need. And so would you stand with me? I'm going to pray for us. And um, after I'm done praying, I'm going to walk out those back doors. And if you want to get baptized, we have everything you need. If you didn't come ready, it's all good. We got short shirts, undies, towels, hair dryers, everything you need. We are ready for you. Don't let, don't let some silly circumstance like that keep you from doing what you know God wants you to do. And so I'm going to pray for us. We're going to worship, and then we're going to celebrate life change. Let's do it. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that we don't have to let the devil rule our minds. We don't have to let our sinful nature, our lower self, rule our lives. Instead, we can turn to you in the face of our problems and we can say, Jesus, here's what we got. And so I speak on behalf of so many people in this room, so many parents, so many so many young adults in this room who are searching for purpose and direction. God, I speak on behalf of so many students in the room I speak on behalf of so many people in this room who have been following you for years, the elderly saints of our church. God, I speak on behalf of all of us when we say all we have is yours. All we have is yours. And we trust that it will be more than enough. That you would multiply our capacity. God, I pray the best days are ahead for Peak City. I pray that you would multiply our impact, multiply our love for one another, multiply our our effectiveness in this city. Multiply it, God. Do what only you can do. So God, right now, we invite you into this space. We invite you into our lives. Meet with us in a powerful way as we celebrate. We join all of heaven and we celebrate the public declaration of these private decisions that have been made for you. And it's in the powerful name of Jesus. We pray together by saying, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this Peak City message today. If you'd like more information on Peak City Church or if you'd like to give to the mission here in Colorado Springs, then check us out at peakcityco.com.